Welcome to the 25th Energy Fair. Incredible. So I have the pleasure of, of introducing uh, Marcin Jakubowski, the CEO and CEO is officially CEO, founder of Open Source Ecology. And stand over here. Uh, three years ago, uh, I was teaching a workshop here, and uh, Nick Hyla, who's our current executive director, he wasn't holding that position at the time, but he brought me into his office, and he was like, you got to check this out. And he played me Marchand's TED Talk, and it's about five minutes long, and afterwards, I was like, this is incredible. I went straight back into the classroom, and I was like, you guys got to put down what you're doing, and you got to check this out. And so for the past couple of years, whenever something kind of came up in a relevant classroom, I would be like, listen, students, you guys got to check this out. This is revolutionary. And so a couple of months ago, uh, I was given the opportunity to host one of these workshops to build a machine um, at Mid State Technical College. And so we've spent the last three days um, experiencing extreme manufacturing. Uh, there was about 25 or 30 of us we had an incredible time learning to weld and making one of these. And with the help of Riverside Fuel and their beautiful tractor, we made a brick. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we made a brick. So we, we had, a, had a great time. And so uh, with any, without any further ado, this is Marchin. You guys got to check this out. Is this working? Okay, that looks good. Okay, well, I'm glad to be back in Wisconsin. So I went to school here for my grad, grad studies. And uh, that was about 10 or 15 years ago. I, I went to my first energy fair, so I'm glad to be back. That's awesome. So, okay, so first of all, so can everybody hear me in the back? It's all okay? Okay. Let's see this. Okay, I'll try to speak a little louder. Okay, so first of all, who's uh, who's seen uh, the TED Talk? Quite a bit of you, but for those who haven't seen it, I'll play that again. So it's a, still a great overview of the work that we do, and I'll tell you about what the progress has been since then, and a little bit about myself as far as what led me to do that. So let's get started. So the concept here is about creating the open source economy, a collaborative economy where we simply unleash innovation by open collaboration. I mean, that's, that's the underlying theme. Uh, as far as some contact info, the, our main site is opensourceecology.org. Follow us on Facebook, Open Source Ecology. We put regular updates there. If you'd like to see some pictures of the recent event and some of this brick pre pressing, it's, uh, we, we Facebook quite a bit. So, and then you can contact me, Marchin, at opensourceecology.org. So this is our Facebook page. Um, and let's start with the TED Talks. Hi, my name is Marcin, farmer, technologist. I was born in Poland, now in the US. I started a group called Open Source Ecology. We've identified the 50 most important machines that we think takes for modern life to exist. Things from tractors, bread ovens, circuit makers. Then we set out to create an open source, DIY, do-it-yourself version that anyone can build and maintain at a fraction of the cost. We call this the Global Village Construction Set. So let me tell you a story. So I finished my 20s with a PhD in fusion energy, and I discovered I was useless. I had no practical skills. I mean, the world presented me with options, and I took them. I guess you can call it the consumer lifestyle. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. I bought a tractor, then it broke. I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again. And pretty soon, I was broke too. I realized that the truly appropriate, low-cost tools that I needed to start a sustainable farm and settlement just didn't exist yet. I needed tools that were robust, 
modular, highly efficient and optimized, low cost, made from local and recycled materials that would last a lifetime, not designed for obsolescence. I found that I would have to build them myself. So I did just that. And I tested them. And I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then I published the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on a wiki. Then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines during dedicated project visits. So far, we have prototyped eight of the 50 machines, and now the project is beginning to grow on its own. We know that open source has succeeded with tools for managing knowledge and creativity, and the same is starting to happen with hardware, too. We're focusing on hardware because it is hardware that can change people's lives in such tangible material ways. If we can lower the barriers to farming, building, manufacturing, then we can unleash just massive amounts of human potential. That's not only in the developing world. Our tools are being made for the American farmer, builder, entrepreneur, maker. We've seen lots of excitement from these people who can now start a construction business, parts manufacturing, organic CSA, or just selling power back to the grid. Our goal is a repository of published design so clear, so complete, that a single burned DVD is effectively a civilization starter kit. I've planted 100 trees in a day. I've pressed 5,000 bricks in one day from the dirt beneath my feet and built a tractor in six days. From what I've seen, this is only the beginning. If this idea is truly sound, then the implications are significant. A greater distribution of the means of production, environmentally sound supply chains, and a newly relevant DIY maker culture can hope to transcend artificial scarcity. We're exploring the limits of what we all can do to make a better world with open hardware technology. Thank you. So that was in 2011. So what drove me to do this? Just a couple of personal notes. I come from Poland uh, at age of 10. So it's a small country with a lot of powerful neighbors. We do have a long history of war. And my grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather was derailing German supply trains. This, this was in World War II. And those kinds of thoughts kind of stuck with me. So when I left Poland in 1982, this was the scene in my hometown. So this is not a parade, this is a real scene behind the Iron Curtain, time of scarcity. But then things got better. I moved to America, went to Princeton undergrad, and then the University of Wisconsin-Madison for the grad school, and that's where I discovered that I was useless. <laughs> but at the same time, that's the last year of that program, that was, I think, 2004, I also started the, the Open Source Ecology Project which is essentially what happens when open source meets ecology, meets economy. It's a new paradigm, new, new way of thinking about things. So then we moved over to, to, to Missouri, to Maysville, Missouri, and began to build. By 2011, we had the, the eight different prototypes, and then we continued such that by the end of 2012, we had, had about 60 to prototypes, including about a dozen replications in five countries around the world. So the first one was a guy in Texas, who James Slade, who downloaded our plans, built our machine. And when I first saw that, I thought it was a Photoshop of, of our brick press. But no, that's him, the real plans, real blueprints, downloaded, made into a real machine to press bricks like these right here. There was a number of other replications, the green machine that's in the States, a power cube, a universal power unit, hydraulic power unit tractor that was built by a group of high school students in Pasadena. There was a tractor attempt in Guatemala. There was another brick press in Italy. One all the way across the world in China. And so on. So, so the, the concept is about bringing appropriate tools to make life easier. Because I believe that true freedom 
really revolves around our individual ability to, to convert those abundant resources out there to free ourselves from material constraints. So that's a game that humanity has not mastered. The artificial scarcity is a manifest itself in wars and poverty, hunger and many ills. A lot of different, different issues from personal to political are still determined by material scarcity. And now because we have transcended, I mean, we don't have any limits in terms of how we can, how effectively we can survive and thrive. Um, that kind of scarcity that we see today is something that's not really natural. It's, it's pretty much human made. So what to do about it? Well. Basic idea. Um, let's see. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue going. So that's the just a little, couple of words on a machine. So our brick press is uh, we call it the liberator, and why? Because it liberates you from the main cost of living, which is your housing. So you can produce with this machine, you can produce up to up to ten bricks a minute, which is about five thousand per day, which is enough for a small house. The machine itself costs about four thousand dollars in materials, including the full automatic controller including an Arduino controller, everything is open source. You can actually download the files to make your own circuits for this and also to cut your own case. We have a transparent case. We like to be transparent for the electronics. And you can pretty much take everything there is and without, without you doing the work, you can either give this to a local fabricator, you can download the, the computer-aided control files for a cutting table, for it's like a CNC cutting table, and you can make this quite readily. Now the price is 4,000 materials. We sell these now for $9,000. The nearest competitor with the same throughput machine would cost you about 52,000. So there is a, a real economic case for making these open source blueprints work, which means that we're simply taking out all the different competitive waste out of product development, such as the design process, which, which costs a lot of money otherwise, but we're collaborating with many people, such as, for example, a designer of another brick press worked with me. I mean, I pretty much told him, okay, I'm doing this open source project. A lot of people are quite willing to, to contribute their expertise to make things happen. So it's a cost-effective way to do things. So back in 2012, we were on a version four of the Life Track. That's, the, that's our open source tractor. In 2013, we built the next version, which is Lifetrack 5, which is now being used in an urban gardening project in New Orleans right now. And on December 18, 2012. Since then, we continued and built Lifetrack 5, Lifetrack 6, the saw pulverizer, an upgraded brick press, laser cutter, iron worker, backhoe, and trencher. Let's run it! Then we showed a proof of concept of how our open source tools can work in harmony to produce a beautiful, affordable home, the micro house. And in another proud achievement, Lifetrack 5 is now working in a pilot project, an urban farm in New Orleans. We have demonstrated radical optimization of prototyping speed, resulting from our modular life-size Lego building set with simple components such as tubing, plate and bolts and interchangeable modules. As an example, in 2012 we built an iron worker machine for cutting 1 by 8 inch steel slabs and we built the machine over a period of 6 months. 
This November, we proved that we could build a radically redesigned, simplified version in under 12 hours. Let me repeat, that is one day. We have proven that we can reduce prototyping cycles from the typical timescale of months to the timescale of days. Our modular components promote this, such as the universal rotor that transforms from a tractor wheel in one form to a trencher in another in just a few minutes. The Microhouse success sparked a lot of interest and the designer, Chris Reinhardt, is now OSE's architecture product lead. Building on these successes, we are evolving the extreme manufacturing techniques to a revenue model based on educational production workshops. Participants pay us for a structured build experience and stakeholder clients can walk away with a finished product made during the workshop such as a brick press or a house. This is already working for us, we have secured clients for both. We will be developing this workshop model for all of our products and we will be refocusing our core staff as organizers and leaders of these workshops. Our scaling model is training people, an overlay of structured education on top of production. To help develop this new model, we are also starting a joint program with Katarina Mota of Everywhere Tech, a project dedicated to open source tech transfer. This includes creating a residency program, inviting highly skilled open source contributors to help refine our work. On the documentation front, we are currently using the Dazuki platform. Now in a few clicks, one can access any single development point or how-to guide for any of our machines. We have also achieved a milestone of real-time documentation. We upload media to the Trovebox open source photo site and remote collaborators generate instructionals real-time so that how-to guides are completed at the same time as the build. On the infrastructure front, we propose to take our built environment to the next level towards a mecca for open source projects. So, so this is last year's uh, prize. This is uh, the brick press in the back of the micro house. It's got siding on it because the bricks themselves are not stabilized. We're just using the straight earth from the site, right from behind the house there. And you have to protect that from water. So you can do things like siding or you can do overhangs or you can stabilize the bricks with cement. Like, like this brick here is stabilized with about, about a pound of cement to about a 10 pound brick. And that becomes pretty much water resistant. You can leave that outside as an outer, outer facing wall. And this, this is, once again, about empowering people to do the things that they want. Um, the concept we're relying on here is that the, I mentioned the word artificial scarcity. So the first thing we have to consider, and this is an energy fact here, the, the sun throws at us at the whole surface of the earth about 10,000 times more power than we use even in our wasteful economy. So that tells us that the energy basis, I mean, we're pretty secure on that, and then it's a matter of converting those common resources out there through technological means into the life stuff of modern civilization. How do we do that? When you really think about it, all of the wealth that we enjoy today for a modern standard of living relies on rocks, soil, sunlight, plants, water. Those are all abundant. Yet the productive mechanism of society is what makes it scarce, artificially so. What if we can survive and thrive up to a modern standard of living, and not only that, at two hours a day of work and from local resources? How would that be? So that's, a, that's an interesting point to make, because once we can master the provision of all the goods and services to society, we start thinking about different things. What's really important in our life? And I like to refer to Daniel Pink's TED talk on this point. He has a talk about the surprising science of motivation, which says that it's not a bigger carrot on a stick that drives us, but much more fundamental values, and those being autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Those are the fundamental drivers in all of us, whether we know that or not. And it's something that a lot of us here are in touch with. Um, today, literally, the power of a microfactory is under our hands with advanced technology that we have today. Um, if you have seen 3D printing, for example, that 
things like 3D printing are making that very clear for, for many people. You can, this is Lil's bot open source 3D printer, which you can materialize things out of code, out of computer code, which is pretty spectacular. And for me, personally, my life has been changed when I built the first tractor and just saw the power that, that we can all have in terms of our, our ability to produce the things that we need and to survive and thrive. But most of the world doesn't think like that. So did you know that in 2012, Apple and Google spent more on patents than on research and development? That's an outstanding figure. So that tells you about how much competitive waste still is out there. Because you can imagine what would happen if those resources were spent on solving wicked problems, pressing world issues that are still there. It's an opportunity that we're bypassing a little bit. So we like to talk about the open source economy where we don't worry about patents, we give away everything, we're radically brave to, to share the things that we have in terms of the, the knowledge, uh, product design, everything, because we believe that everybody can, can win. Building on these successes, we are evolving the extreme manufacturing techniques to a revenue model based on educational production workshops. Participants pay us for a structured build experience and stakeholder clients can walk away with a finished product made during the workshop such as a brick press or a house. This is already working for us, we have secured clients for both. We will be developing this workshop model for all of our products and we will be refocusing our core staff as organizers and leaders of these workshops. Our scaling model is training people, an overlay of structured education on top of production. To help develop this new model, we are also starting a joint program with Katarina Mota of Everywhere Tech, a project dedicated to open source tech transfer. This includes creating a residency program, inviting highly skilled open source contributors to help refine our work. On the documentation front, we are currently using the Dozuki platform. Now in a few clicks, one can access any single development point or how-to guide for any of our machines. We have also achieved a milestone of real-time documentation. We upload media to the Trovebox open source photo site and remote collaborators generate instructionals real-time so that how-to guides are completed at the same time as the build. On the infrastructure front, we propose to take our built environment to the next level towards a mecca for open source projects. We will be building more microhouses, an electronics workshop, an outdoor facility for summer overflow housing and a recreation center. This is intended to attract high caliber people for world class work by making our site a truly pleasant and inspirational experience. I'm also going on a college tour to recruit. We intend to increase our applicant pool to grow the organization from within and to allow people to self-select for our one-of-a-kind experience. As part of this we will provide a more structured educational curriculum. This is our program in a nutshell. With our learnings on social production, with our extreme development techniques, and with a stellar team, we're ready to finish the entire GVCS by end of 2015. We owe this to the world. Thank you. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> that goes right on the cover of the funding proposal. Yeah. <laughs> Hanging on. Hanging on. We call that extreme production. Well, can this ever scale? So this is what we're exploring. Let's compare it to the traditional business model, which says that good artists copy and great artists steal. That's Picasso said that. I mean, that, that means that we're all building upon all the tons of knowledge. We're standing on the shoulders of giants to, to build on what society has developed over, over its history. Now, today, people also think that in the, main business, the mainstream business model, that we also have to prevent others from stealing from us. Well, that's people like Jobs, Steve Jobs say that. Um, and that's one way to look at it. But, but we turn this thing upside down and... Uh, our, our model includes two points. One, still, still the fact that we build on all the prior work that's available to us, but also we think that the greatest artists help others steal from them. 
So what's that mean? I mean, that simply means that we foster radical collaboration. We're not afraid to give things away. Now, that's the first time anyone ever clapped at that. That's interesting. Okay, that's, that's our goal here. We're saying that if we give something away, many other people can contribute, and with the good energy that comes from that, more people are actually willing to contribute back into the pool of common knowledge. And that's our method where we're proposing that as a way that innovation can simply be accelerated towards the open source economy where, imagine, I mean, companies did not compete with one another to have the better product. I mean, imagine everyone had access to the best design, best practices, and that continued to be developed as a collaborative effort between, between everyone. Well, that's the kind of paradigm that we'd like to see in this world. That's what we're working for. This year, we're doing a various workshops. So, so far, we've had a workshop on the micro house, on a brick press. We also had a 3D printer workshop. In the second half of the year, we're looking at doing a, a tractor building workshop. And we're going to try to build that tractor in a single day. Uh, a CNC torch table. The torch table is a machine that lets you cut steel by computer control, such that you can produce all the parts for a tractor or the brick press readily, like within hours, and then you can just weld and assemble. We're also considering a, a laser cutter workshop. We'll see how far that goes. But basically, a lot of different workshops on different topics. I also mentioned the microcar and uh, the power cube. So we're actually adding these workshops in collaboration with other people. And we're also doing, basically, the model is if, if you'd like to, if anyone out there, I'll invite you. if you'd like to collaborate on a workshop with us, we'd love to do something like a 50-50 revenue share in the workshop regarding the tuition and all that. So, so it's a model that we're trying to, to scale and get a lot of different people to work with us as a scalable way to, to improve the research and development effort because anybody who ends up hosting a workshop or building the machines, they, they end up contributing to the effort in some way, to the design, different ideas. It's, it's the collective effort that that makes it powerful. Now, how do we do this? How do we achieve this single day build? So we, we do what's known as module-based design. So we break down our machines into all the different modules. Like, for example, the, the brick press. It's made of the main frame. It's got arms, legs, hopper, soil loading drawer, the hydraulic system. So we pretty much break down the machine into small parts, and then people can develop them, all the parts, in parallel. And that's a way to accelerate the effort if you have a large group of people. So what we do is, um, if you go to, op um, this is actually our Dozuki platform, opensourceecology.dozuki.com. We have all our 50 machines up there. When you go into each machine, it's broken down into all the different modules. And then for each single module, we go through all the different development steps. Everything from the concept design to the bills of materials, the, the CAD files, instructional videos, and everything else that comes into making a single, single module or a machine. So we develop on the module level so that we can break down the problem into many little parts. So like Wikipedia, you can have many, many people co collaborating on a project. This is another example of module-based design. That's another project out there called Wikispeed. So they've broken down their, their car into the, the main frame, the wheel units, the interior module, the, the, the aero shell, and things like that, bumper module, so that, once again, if, if a large, you have a large team, all the people can build this in parallel and then assemble it rather quickly. So that, that's basically how we're, we're seeing that collaborative production where people get together and these workshops can produce many of the things that would otherwise be relegated to perhaps some slave labor in another far country. So that's a good idea. Now, on top of this module-based design, we also follow the construction set approach. So that means that instead of just designing one item, we design a construction set for that item. So like for the tractor, it's not really a tractor, the, the Lifetrack 5 plans, it's really, we're really more after a Lifetrack construction set where if we design a tractor by using similar principles, you can enlarge parts so you can make a micro tractor, a bulldozer, a, a truck or tractor. Uh, backhoe, other implements, 
by using a set of common parts like the interchangeable power units, interchangeable wheel units, modular frames, and many other components that can interchange because we're trying to see what's the mi absolute minimum set of parts that can get you to create an entire infrastructure that can make society thrive. That's a worthwhile experiment. We're just trying to determine what that is. So when, when we look at any single one of our machines, it's not really that machine itself. It looks like that because it's got relations to many other machines, and sometimes that's pretty hard for people to grasp because we're not just designing one machine, we're designing for the entire set. So that's a different design principle. Now, there is encouragement regarding the, the collaborative development process. If we're able to break down the machines into all the different modules and then break down each module into all the different design steps, uh, well, if we got to do that as good as Wikipedia, which has about a half, it's like a, they get about a half a million articles per year. Well, if one of our design points was equal to a, a, a Wikipedia article, then we'd be done with the entire project in like half a year. So, as far as all the 50 tools being developed. So that's, I mean, there's hope, but it's really hard to get a large collaborative effort going like that. You're talking about um, people using... I mean, you're using real materials which have costs and people have different tools and uh, it's just a much more complex process than just software or information development. But because most of this is information, you can treat it somewhat like the Wikipedia problem where you can break it down into many, many parts. So if we can succeed in breaking down our project into understandable tiny parts, then many people can contribute. Little details about all the development steps. Uh, okay, I show this picture. This is um, this is actually a connector. I just want to make a point here. This is a connector from a 3D printer. Once again, from the Lulzbot open source 3D printer. So this is a technical, like a graphical technical explanation of all the parts. Uh, pretty much, if you had this in front of you, you can go look at the table downstairs, source the parts from different manufacturers, and you can build this. But the cool thing about it is that it's open source. There's a license on the top right, top left corner there, which says that permission is granted to copy, distribute, and modify this document under terms of the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International Public License. So basically it's a license, an open source license, which allows you to, to use these plans, to build this, to sell it if you want. And we're particular about licenses that there's CC, so that's Creative Commons. By means attribution. Um, SA, share alike, that's the license we use, CC by SA. There's another license that's, that says NC, which is non-commercial. We don't really like that because that means you can't actually make a living off this. We want people, all our plans are open for you to produce them as well, so that if you want to earn money from this, you're welcome to do so because that's a great motivator. You've got to make a living somehow. So it's good if it's in, a, in an open source way, in an ethical calling. This is a little bit of our calendar that's a little old here. So this is, um, this is an overhead view of our site here, our facility. We've got 30 acres in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. This is Maysville. And uh, here's our main, main workshop, our house. This year we're getting a little bit of agriculture going. We've got an orchard. We're building a lot of different infrastructure this year still. We're building more micro houses. We're building a second workshop, a campground. So there's a lot of construction going on. We're, we're continuously developing the infrastructure to make it comfortable for people. Uh, also, uh, one note, I, I started the True Fans program a, a number of years ago when, as, I, as you saw in the pictures, I was broke and I needed some money. So I basically published all the plans online, started a blog, and uh, started a True Fans program where people are donating a small amount per month to the project. So right now we have about 300 or so contributors like that. Uh, that also helps the project, so you can, you're welcome to subscribe to that as well. Uh, you get 25% off our workshops if you subscribe as a true fan. little plug for that. Um, yeah, so, but I mean, that's about all I have. Um, so the bottom line is about uh, collaborative development for accelerating, the, accelerating innovation. A lot of times uh, in the early days, people associate this with kind of like hunker and bunker so survivalism or like end of the world scenarios environmentalism or whatever, but the applications of this are, I mean, are many. It's like, we're just providing the tools. There's applications to all kinds, all kinds of areas, 
from environmentalism to resilience to just making a better economy in general by getting everybody involved in that process and lowering the barriers so that every, everyone can win. So thank you very much. And I'd like to take some questions if anybody's got any questions.